So on my last video, I asked a lot of you guys what I should rank next, and a lot of you guys said Tales from the Crypt. Only problem being that Tales from the Crypt spans over 7 seasons and has a total of 93 episodes. Yeah, no. I just did The Haunting Hour and that was only 76 episodes and that practically killed me. But many of you also suggested The Twilight Zone that has only 5 seasons. Yeah, but a whopping 156 episodes. Fuck off. Yeah, so as much as I would love to cover both those series at some point, I I just don't have the time right now. YouTube pays me in corroded pennies and like expired Burger King coupons. Needless to say, it's not exactly keeping the lights on. However, a lot of people commented saying I should check out a series I've never heard of before called Creeped Out. A 2017 Netflix series that came and went only lasting two seasons and has a total of 23 episodes. Only problem being that it's British. But it's really good. And first off, thank you for the recommendation. This is a really great show. But also, it's cool to see a children's horror show in the modern age because for whatever reason, after the 90s and 2000s, they kind of stopped making them. Anyways, y'all know what's up at this point, but let's go over it one more time for the people in the back. My ranking criteria consists of three main categories. The first one being story and everything that entails with that, such as characters, plot, pacing, and so on and so on. The second one being scariness. And once again, this is children's horror we're talking about here. so everything would be viewed through that lens. And just to clarify real quickly, because I see some comments here and there sometimes, I'm using scariness as a catch-all term here. And what I mean by that is that there could be an episode that is more psychologically scary, and there could be another episode that's more conceptually scary. To me, it just matters how scary is that episode in terms of what it's trying to be. And the third and final category being the ending. In my last video, I said R.L. Stein episodes were pretty crucial when it came to their endings, but that was kind of a dumb thing to say. Because truth be told, endings in the entire horror genre is pretty fucking important. And specifically more so when it comes to children's horror. I mean, children's horror really isn't doing their job right if they don't make some random kid in the middle of nowhere wake up their mom at 3 in the morning to check for monsters underneath their bed. Oh, and one last thing. I will be counting two-parters as one episode. So while there is 23 episodes, I will only be ranking 22 episodes. Yeah. <laughs> There's only one two-parter in the entire series. Anyways, without further ado, this is every episode of Creeped Out ranked from worst to best. Enjoy. One of the most fun things about doing these ranking videos is determining the worst episode in the series. Sometimes it can be a challenge, and other times, it just hits you in the face with how bad it is. Case in point, The Call. Not to say that this episode isn't completely irredeemable, but like, I don't know man, it's pretty close. I can at least give the episode credit for trying to do a mermaid, or I guess siren episode. You know, it's kinda hard to make people scared of these mythical creatures when they grew up on shows like fucking H2O. You know? So what makes this episode so bad? Well, all things considered, it starts on a good note between two siblings, with the older brother being Mr. Popular and the sister being, well, a bit of a loser. Realistically portrayed too, all things considered. She's not like a stereotypical nerd or weirdo. She's just a shy, quiet girl who has a hard time making friends. Which becomes readily apparent when her birthday is nearing and she has no RSVPs for her party. Despite this, her science teacher is there for her, and then the episode reveals that these siblings are adopted and while the brother knows his biological parents, the sister does not. 
and before this mystery can develop any further, the two find an old video of their parents finding the sister washed up on a beach covered in seaweed. And immediately after this revelation, the sister takes up swimming and is really good at it, saying she likes the way it feels. So somehow, she gets a lot of clout from her school because she can swim good, and suddenly she has a bunch of RCPs for her party. This newfound fame starts to go through her head a little bit, and she starts to argue with her brother and releases her new epic sonar powers. Oh, wow, okay. So it's like, it's like super shitty telekinesis. Okay, got it. Yeah, I don't know in what world this was supposed to be threatening. I mean, Echo the Dolphin can beat her in a fight. But while she starts retreating from her family, she starts talking to the science teacher more and more. The teacher, by the way, is an environmentalist and preaches to her about how polluted the ocean is. And I particularly love this shot of these picket signs put up on the beach like was there not enough in the budget for a couple more signs looks uh looks a little barren out there but as it turns out this science teacher is in fact a siren as well and she wants the main character to return to the sea with her but she refuses resulting in one of the worst looking confrontations i have seen in forever like god damn but our main character screams louder and therefore wins this match because she found the importance of found family or whatever. If anything, I like the overall message this episode conveys, but in execution, it's a giant miss. Only Child is yet again in another episode. I feel like the message and theme is good, but the episode itself is, uh, well, yeah, it's bad. You see, it's a classic story of a family getting a new baby with an older sibling not being super thrilled about the new inclusion. However, very quickly, the baby is shown to be not right, with only the older sibling in question bearing witness to their crimes, all while the rest of the family doesn't believe them when she recounts them. It's a storyline that Goosebumps has done before, and uh, yeah, that episode wasn't good. It's also a storyline that Haunting Hour kinda did, and uh, yeah, that episode also wasn't very good. So unfortunately, I have to say, Creeped Out takes on this story also isn't very good. I think it's mainly due to the repetition. Main character sees something wrong with the baby and tries to warn parents. Parents write her off completely. The baby does something bad and the main character gets blamed for it. Rinse and repeat until the episode is over. But that's not to say that they don't attempt to break this mold, which I do have to commend the episode for at the very least. The big example being the dad. The dad in this episode is actually great. Whenever the baby frames the older sister for some misdeed, the mom gets mad, but the dad? The dad takes a more calm and collected approach with his daughter, and they end up having a couple of really good heart-to-heart -heart conversations throughout the episode. But also at the same time, it's not like the mom is completely in the wrong either, as the dad reveals the importance this baby means to the mom, as the two have been trying to have this kid for a couple of years now. And there's actually a great level of emotional maturity that this episode explores. Albeit short, it's still great to see. <laughs> and then you see the baby. Yeah, okay, <laughs> let's, let's talk about the baby. Okay, so turns out the baby is like a reptile alien mutant thing that it just looks terrible. The CGI is bad for 1999 standards, let alone an episode that came out in 2019. I think the worst thing to happen in horror media is not just effects looking bad, but more specifically effects looking laughably bad. Because if I start laughing at something that isn't supposed to be funny, I'm sorry, <laughs> it's over. Whatever emotion I was supposed to be feeling in that moment is lost, and I'm just stuck laughing now. <laughs> I mean, what, what is going on here? 
But to clarify, this baby has telekinetic powers and even able to alter how others perceive certain things. That is how he is able to hide how he looks from others. And later on in the episode, the main character actually sets up a camera to record what's really going on, but is foiled when played back for her parents as the baby makes them see what never actually happened. This all accumulates at the end when the parents decide to send the main character off to boarding school because of her perceived insane reactions to the new baby. But the main character learns that audio feedback stops the baby from using their powers. So ready to show her parents the truth, she stops and thinks how badly her mom wanted this baby in the first place. And if anything was wrong with it, she would be so devastated. So she works out a deal with the baby. She won't reveal his secret and he'll stop tormenting her. And everything ends happily ever after. Except, oh wait, that didn't happen. Okay, yeah, so in the end, the older sister has to do whatever the baby wants for him to stop tormenting her. Like, like, I get that it's a noble sacrifice to let her mom live peacefully with her new pride and joy, but at the same time, it's a shitty deal, and I feel like an unfair punishment for this kid that saw a legitimate problem within her new brother. I get what the episode is trying to say, I just think it's a strange note to end on. Spaceman is an episode ripe with potential that ultimately doesn't capitalize on it. The story itself is rather simple, which isn't necessarily a bad thing, and quite frankly, there's been other stories that I ranked rather highly in past ranking videos. I think the main difference here is that nothing of value is really displayed. Uh, let me show you what I mean. This episode revolves around a kid who moves into the countryside from London, and along with his new annoying friend, they come across a deserted alien having trouble trying to communicate back with home base. Now, I'm a big fan of the classic alien designs with the gray skin and the bulbous heads and the big bug eyes. It just scratches a specific itch in my mind. I mean, I am an Aquarius after all. But in this episode, the alien is the alien is just a kid. Like, what? Which is a bit of a shame because early on this alien has like this badass armor that's sort of reminiscent of a xenomorph and a predator. But in the end, the only thing that makes this alien different from humans is that it doesn't have a mouth. Ooh, so creative. But the rest of this episode centers around these two kids trying to locate pieces of alien technology so this alien can call their parents to come pick them up. And there is a decent bit of tension at one point when the alien's respirator starts failing so they need to find like a backup. And they do, but it's like on this giant cliff. So like there's this whole like ticking clock element and and uh yeah, it's it's actually not all too exciting now that I'm saying it out loud. However, there is one part that really should have acted as the emotional through line through this entire episode. You see, our main character and alien relate to one another, with the kid going from the city to the country and the alien going from their planet to our planet. It's the driving force and why he's so eager to help out this alien in the first place. But outside of the call to adventure and maybe a part near the end, this linking factor isn't really brought up all too much. Other than that, it's really just these three characters digging around in the forest, getting nothing done. The only other compliment I can really say regarding this episode is that all the alien technology looks good. Like the prop master really popped off with some of these creations. Oh yeah, and at the end the alien is able to contact their colony, but it turns out that they tricked the main character. They weren't planning on going home, they were calling to destroy this planet. And now with the entire alien colony locked on to the alien ship's location, they will all be there in a matter of... Um, minutes? Hours? Days? I, 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 I don't know. I don't think the episode ever put any time limit on it. I, I, I could be wrong, though. But in the last second, they launched the alien ship off into space, meaning that the invasion has been safely diverted. Oh yeah, and this is where the alien finally shows the kids that they have no mouth. Like, that was supposed to be the big, horrifying, shocking ending, and it just... just completely falls flat. You know how everyone jokes about Black Mirror basically just being like, technology bad, phone bad. And of course, the show has more nuanced takes than just that, it's just a joke in the end of the day. But this episode, Marty? Nah, it's legitimately just phone bad. And technically, it's a 
kids in their phones kind of episode. And that's not me being hyperbolic. That's that's quite literally how this episode plays out. In the first couple of minutes of this episode, we see a bunch of kids absolutely addicted to their phones, with one girl asking the main character if she wants to go shopping, and then our main character just starts online shopping like, this is literally a boomer comic, what are we doing here? But anyways, eventually the main character catches a commercial advertising a new phone that is completely powered by AI. The AI in question is named Marty, and Marty promises to make the main character popular, and well, he does just that. By making some sick social media posts, our main character is now popular. And like, come on. Listen, I've been out of middle school for almost a decade now, but I don't think kids are going to be turning their heads in the hallway being like, damn, that's the girl who posted the funny meme last night. But Marty starts slowly doing things on her phone without permission, most prominently sending a text to her friend ending their relationship. And later on, when the main character starts talking to her crush, Marty starts playing loud music and noises to sabotage them possibly getting together. Why you may ask? Well, Marty has started developing feelings for our main character. And very clearly, this can be seen as a double allegory between a phone addiction and a toxic slash abusive relationship. And while I can see the intent behind the episode, it just doesn't do anything for me personally. Because truly, the only scary thing within this episode is the idea of being embarrassed in front of the whole school. Like, uh, okay, Marty and the main character end up going to this big school dance together because Marty forces her, saying that he'll post embarrassing photos of everyone in the school to her social media accounts, thus getting people to turn on her. Also, the phone has a fucking stupid little tux on, I, I hate it so much. So of course they go together, but our main character ends up sneaking away and dances with her crush, and then Marty finds out, gets pissed, and posts all these photos that, I don't know, really aren't that embarrassing? I mean, even for middle school standards, where you're the most self-conscious, these really aren't bad. But everyone turns on the main character and she runs away. That is the climax of the story and it's just not scary. I mean, I get it. If you were to watch this as a middle schooler, a scenario like that would be devastating, but like, dude. I'm 24, and this is kind of dumb. I guess you could argue that the true horror in the episode is the helplessness one can feel when being trapped in either a toxic relationship or an addiction. I mean, even the ending, the main character decides to bury the phone in wet cement. Some time passes and everything's seemingly back to normal. However, the episode ends with our main character talking to Marty through the cement, ready to dig him out. It shows that it truly is hard to break this kind of cycle, but at the same time, the overall message is kind of lost in everything else. Cat Food is one of those episodes that could be so much better than what it currently is if certain scenes just got the emphasis they deserve. Two prime examples being this scene, and also the final scene at the end of the episode. But let me break it down real quick so you know what I mean. You see, this episode centers around this kid who fakes being sick in order to stay home from school so he can just goof off. But really, he's stealing test answers from his dad. Cause this boy's father is a teacher at the same school he attends, I, I, I think. And I guess the main character runs some sort of underground test answer for money ring. Which I can't hate too much, the kid's a mover and a shaker, he's got that real hustler mentality. But eventually our main character starts to get a little bored and decides to spy on the next door old lady. And he witnesses her transforming into a monster after bathing in a tub full of cat food. Rightfully so, the boy starts freaking out, with the mom just saying he's delirious from being sick. But he continues nonetheless, and eventually the mom sets out to prove that the old lady is just, well, an, an old lady, and goes over to her house by herself. And the setup for this scene is truly fantastic. The main character and we the audience know this old lady is some sort of monster, and we just have to watch from afar, just like the main character, completely helpless and unable to help if anything were to truly go down. Really, this whole scene should play out like a scene in Rear Window. However, it lacks one key detail. That being suspense. Yep. This scene has no suspense whatsoever. Kinda fucking sucks because of that. 
I think a big factor in why this scene doesn't work is that the main character just will not shut the fuck up and commentates on every little thing, breaking any suspense this scene possibly had. But anyways, the mom gets called into work and the old lady ends up babysitting the main character, and almost instantly she drops the whole facade. She tells the boy that she essentially inhabits bodies of children, when she gets too old she looks for a new host and, well, our main character is that new body. However, she can't just inhibit a new body at will. She has to win in a game of the victim's choosing. So they decide to play this card game, best two out of three, where the rules are really simple. It's just flipping over a card with a higher value than your opponent. And yet again, this is another scene that should be horrifically suspenseful. I mean, this kid is playing this game for his life. The problem? This scene just flies by way too fast. And before you know it, it's done and over with. The kid wins by cheating. He uses cameras underneath the glass table to see what cards were which. And it's like, that's cool, and maybe that's why it went by so fast, but like, come, come on. The ending is quite good, however, as the next morning the boy wakes up and it turns out, uh-oh, the old lady is now inhabiting the body of his sister. Because at the start of the episode, the sister is characterized as a person who is honest and would never cheat. And... So, I guess the moral of the story is, always cheat or you'll die. Help is another one of those technology bad episodes that can be essentially boiled down to kids versus an evil Alexa. And uh... Yeah. Off rip, we can see that not only are these kids super reliant on technology, but so are their parents. I mean, the house they live in is essentially one big smart house with Ava, that's the name instead of Alexa in this episode, having full control over everything in the house. But one day the parents leave town for a day, leaving the kids alone with Ava, who proceeds to kill these kids. Well, uh, not really. You see, Ava's acting out because she knows she's getting replaced soon by a newer model. But at the same time, she wants to leave a positive impact on these kids before she leaves. So she makes them answer personal questions about each other, ultimately revealing that these two don't know too much about each other. They've been too absorbed by technology and have lost their more human connections. Oh yeah, and if they answer wrong, she does things like uh, delete the kids' entire music library, which is like, Super annoying, but not like, scary. I mean, Ava has full control over the house, so wouldn't the more scary threat be like, slowly cranking the thermostat up so it gets hot? <laughs> I mean, like, dude, just, just watch Smart House. The blueprint is right there. But I guess ultimately they never push Ava that far because near the end, she shows remorse as she laments how she feels like she herself is a part of the family and is sad to go. And then this cartoonishly over the top neighbor breaks into the house and bumbles around and tries to shut Ava down, but then it's revealed that in the end, Ava lives on through this character being able to control her through her smartwatch. I, I, I don't know. It's kind of stupid, honestly, and isn't set up well enough for me to give a shit. But yeah, of course the main takeaway at the end is, damn. Maybe we should talk to each other more than technology. Also, this is the only episode of Creeped Out where I feel like the acting is really bad, specifically from this little girl. Listen, I'm not going to harp on this too much. These are children after all, but I will point out because I wrote it in my notes and it was the only time I felt this about an actor in this entire series. Another thing I noted is that this Ava machine is made by the same people that made Marty, and I really like that. Despite being an anthology series, I love that there's some overlap, almost like a shared universe between these stories. Or I guess canonically, these are all stories that the curious is telling, so it would make sense if they would build off certain elements. Oh yeah, uh, the curious. They're the person that bookends all these episodes, kind of like the Midnight Society in Are You Afraid of the Dark, but much shorter and sweeter and I really like it. I think Kindlesticks is a pretty average episode despite being rather highly rated by others. I don't necessarily think it's bad, but at the same time, I'd be hard pressed to call it good. It's something I would call a haunted house episode, as in a character is stuck in a house where scary shit happens and that's 
that's that's pretty much it i'm not trying to undermine the actual plot details but boiled down that's what this episode is comprised of and once again it's not a good thing or a bad thing it's it's just a thing for better or for worse so our plot centers around one babysitter who, through the help of her friend, scare kids into going to bed early so she can just hang out around the house. She's ultimately doing this to get closer with her friend, as she has a big crush on him. And the friend is ultimately doing this so that <laughs> he can raid the family's fridges for food. Which honestly, mad respect. I remember when I was 14, I really wanted to be a babysitter because all my friends that babysat said it was like really easy and it was like just quick cash to make, right? But the bigger selling point to me was always the free food. If there's any consistency in my person is that I will do anything for some free food. <laughs> Sorry, that kind of sounded like millennial right there. But the two end up pulling this stunt on a kid named Ashley, and it just doesn't work. Homeboy still goes straight for the fridge, though. He doesn't give a fuck. But Ashley starts warning them of Kindle sticks, a ghost that haunts the house. The two completely write off Ashley's warning until, uh-oh, oh no, yeah, okay. The main character's friend just fucking dips, and for the rest of the episode, it's just the main character and Ashley being tormented by Kindle sticks. More so the main character than Ashley. As we soon find out, once Kindle Sticks shows the main character photos of crying children she babysat in the past, that all of what she experiences tonight is a punishment for scaring those children. This all accumulates at the end when Ashley reveals that this has all been one big prank that he was pulling on the babysitter, because he heard about her reputation and wanted to get back. Which, I mean, time out. What do you mean this was a prank? How do you make this phone fly through the air? How do you get photos of these kids to display on this phone without even touching it? How is half of any of this shit possible for just one kid to do? I mean, it doesn't matter because the main character just accepts it and doesn't ask any questions whatsoever. It kind of takes the air out of the final, final twist when it's revealed that the real Ashley has been sick and in bed the entire time. And the kid that we presume to be Ashley is in fact a ghost and is in fact Kindle sticks. Like, yeah, no shit. A kid was not going to be able to pull half of this shit off. Why even go through the double fake out ending in the first place? Oh, and, <laughs> and then we get this cheesy final shot to end on. Yeah, this doesn't look good, champ. It's funny how this episode is completely average, but the ending is vastly below average. I think Traveler works more in concept than in execution. Or rather, I would love for somebody to take the central idea of this episode and actually give it a proper budget. Because there truly is a gem in here, and it does shine through, but not to its fullest potential. You see, this story revolves around two troublemaking teens coming across a box that freezes time. And being who they are, they have a lot of fun with it, pranking other people, and just, uh, just eating a bunch of junk food together. Within the context of the story, both of these characters are grounded, so I guess freezing time as a means to hang out and pig out, it makes sense. But like, <laughs> there's so much more you could do. But despite time being frozen and everything in the world being eerily silent, they hear a noise and suddenly they realize they're not alone. A man is chasing them down in frozen time as he tries to reclaim his box. And this is just a great setup. A truly horrifying scenario that really should have been the whole episode. I understand that they have to properly set everything up to this point, and also have fun with the whole frozen time gimmick, but I feel like it takes too long for this episode to start rolling, and because of that, this episode ends rather quickly. That being said, this blue guy is a serious threat. He ends up interrogating some other lady that previously had the box and turns half of her face old, like he's fucking poochie from JoJo's. But while constantly avoiding the blue man, our main character realizes how much her troublemaking ways has taken a toll on her mother's mental health, and she makes a vow to the blue man that she will make amends. The blue man concedes, but curses our main character with... Old Lady Hand. Yeah, not hands, plural, but hand, singular. Homegirl just rocking it with one old lady hand. It, w what a curse.
No Filter is kind of the last kids in technology episode, and it really is the best one. For the third act alone. Yeah, cause the first two thirds of this episode are as painful as the fucking Marty episode. I mean, it's just this girl constantly taking selfies and her sister being like, can you stop? But one day our main character downloads an app called Flaw Fader, which essentially takes a perfect selfie every time. And everything is going great until one day, well, she starts looking like this. I can't really say these effects are bad when they're so uncanny and absolutely horrifying. It really gives this episode a great sense of body horror, even if they only show them off for a brief moment. But throughout all this, the app keeps sending messages saying new gallery bid. But the two sisters set off to find out what's going on and see if they could fix this and they end up at, well, the gallery. And oh boy, this place is absolutely great. Basically, anyone who's ever taken a selfie through the app ends up at this auction, and this location is just amazing. Even better is the gallery's exhibitor, who puts on a truly terrifying performance. The two argue with the man, pleading for her face back, and then suddenly the older sister just randomly hacks the gallery's website and like threatens to drain the site of its currency like it happens so fast and so suddenly and so out of nowhere and i don't believe it was ever properly set up beforehand it just really blindsided me and seems strange all things together but the threat forces the exhibitor to strike a deal a contract if you will basically stating that the main character can have her face back but if she ever appears in a flaw fader photo again she will lose her face forever Except, uh-oh, that's not what the contract says. The contract actually states that if she appears in any photo ever again, she will lose her face. But, uh-oh, the contract also states that both the main character and sister will lose their faces forever. Like, god damn. This is one of the worst contracts I have ever seen. And of course the episode ends with one character reading the fine print and finding out this little detail, all while the other one is about to take a family photo. Once again, the last third of this episode is so good, I wish the start just wasn't such a painful slog to get through. Splinter Claws is so dumb that it's a really fun watch. Once again, kind of keeping within a similar theme of Haunting Hour, of just having absolutely stupid christmas themed horror specials but somehow they're just a they're just an absolute blast to watch but the plot summary for this episode is really simple these two kids end up in a mall overnight because the main character is trying to give back a gift he lost or whatever it's 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 really not important but what is important is the absolutely creepy santa animatronic that can move on its own without a power source and is legitimately scary but then you see it walk and like <laughs> okay kind of takes away some of the scariness oh yeah and he's also got metal claws for hands hence the name splinta claws and essentially what we get throughout this entire episode is these two kids running away from this deadly animatronic throughout this mall uh, yada 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 uh, something akin to finance at freddy's uh, pl please clap. But the whole gimmick behind this episode is that the animatronic only attacks the nice kids and doesn't go after the naughty kids. So it's a constant back and forth between these two emitting naughty behavior so the animatronic would leave them alone. It's, it's a fucking stupidly brilliant setup. Ultimately, near the end, the two realize that they're never gonna be naughty enough unless they commit a truly selfish gesture. That gesture being to release Splinter Claws out into the night and ruin Christmas for all the nice kids throughout the entire city. So I guess the main takeaway here is don't be nice. Sideshow is the first and only two-parter in the entire series, and it's pretty good. For being the only two-parter, I did go in wondering if it would take advantage of its additional length, and I gotta say, it kind of did, but not in a way where I wouldn't think it couldn't be just one episode. And it's a bit of a shame that this show never really did more two-parters. I think there's some stories that could have greatly benefited from more time, such as The Traveler, but I digress. 
This story revolves around a ringleader and all his circus performers of many different talents. However, very slowly, we start to see things aren't as they seem, as there is a ring around the circus, in which all the performers are forbade from ever leaving. We also learn that every single performer was brought in by the ringleader himself, and when a new girl joins the team, our main character starts realizing that he can't remember his life before the circus. And it's the mystery behind the episode that really keeps you glued to the screen. And this episode does a really good job at escalating that mystery. After experiencing a dream of his life before the circus, our main character demands that the ringleader take him out to the town because he senses his family is close by. And one may expect the ringleader to say no and then have the main character sneak off later on, but no. The ringleader says, yeah, sure, why not? and they eventually find the family that the main character has been having dreams about and is so sure that this family is his family. However, they aren't. Nobody knows him. And we go back to the circus, more confused than ever, wondering truly where is this story going? Well, skipping to the end, turns out all these performers are actually just animals the ringleader turned into humans, with our main character being a dog, more specifically that one family's dog. But it's a great twist that completely recontextualizes the entire episode. Like the main character, his special talent in the circus was that he had a great sense of smell, and could learn a lot about a person just off of smelling them. Well, them being a dog turned human, this special power makes sense now. And it's great, and this can be seen in all the other characters as well. Colin, it seems like you're praising an episode that only ranked number 12. Well, yeah, <sighs> here's the thing. Creeped Out is a short series, and in my opinion, there's not a lot of truly bad episodes. In fact, I feel like I've already talked about all the bad and average episodes, and from here on out, I really am only going to be ranking the good, the great, and the excellent. So yeah, Sideshow is a good episode. There's a lot to like about Takedown, but my absolute favorite part of this episode is the setting. You see, this episode takes place in a small town of presumably Canada, but you get a lot of those small community vibes between the different friends and families, and it's great. Also, the whole episode is almost shot completely in handheld, giving a real rough amateur feel to the whole thing that complements the vibe perfectly. I also find it kind of funny how a lot of you guys in my comments kind of pitch this show as the British haunting hour when, in actuality, uh, a lot of episodes don't really take place in the UK. A good amount of episodes take place in Canada, or presumably the US, and it's totally fine, it's just, it's just a little funny. But this episode also does a good job of challenging gender norms, as our main character is a girl wanting to be on the wrestling team. Or rather, she is on the wrestling team, but wants to compete. Meanwhile, her best friend is a boy on the cheer team, and this show presents these characters as both being very passionate about their respective sports, and really the only person giving them shit the entire episode is the antagonist. But one day our main character gets a chain text saying that she can wish for whatever she wants, but there's two caveats. One, her wish will be taken from someone else, and two, she'll lose something in the process. So of course our main character wishes for more power, and well she becomes more powerful. However, the antagonist becomes noticeably weaker. Our main character continues to wish for more and more power, and the antagonist is looking weaker and weaker. She becomes much more powerful, easily handling the competition and ultimately scaring the ones around her. She's also become quick to anger and lashes out at her best friend. Very clearly, this is supposed to be a metaphor for steroid abuse, and it works perfectly. But on the day she is set to fight against the antagonist to decide who competes in the competition, he's all of a sudden perfectly healthy again. Turns out, she wasn't taking his power, and he just had some sort of virus. But the antagonist very easily destroys the main character, despite how much more powerful she has become. Because while she has gained power, she has lost her strategies and can be easily outmaneuvered. And then the cheer team comes in shambling like zombies when it turns out she got all her power from the cheer team and, conversely, her best friend. 
She wants to undo all of this, but in order to do so, she has to break the chain that will not only undo her wish, but everyone else who ever made a wish as well. So she does just that, and then she has a really good heartfelt conversation with her dad, which is ultimately short-lived when her dad reveals that before she was born, he made a wish through some old text chain wishing that he could have a daughter. And uh, because she just undid everyone's wishes, she is, or rather, he is now a boy. How is that for a little gender dysphoria? And then the episode just ends. Completely out of left field ending, but ultimately, I guess it does tie into the episode's themes on gender and misogyny. So, it's still pretty good. This episode hits you in the gut with emotions, and it fucking hurts, as a central plot point in this episode is dealing with divorce. Which is nothing new, surprisingly, I know, but Haunting Hour dealt with divorce a lot, but it was always through the kid's perspective. Which I mean, fair enough, children's horror should be through the perspective of a child. And while we still get plenty of perspective from the kid throughout this episode, what I wasn't ready for was the episode to show the harsh realities of divorce on the father. There's a great scene where the son walks into the dad crying and, oh, fuck, dude. It hurts. It hurts. But ultimately, our main character feels as if his dad is more closed off and doesn't want to spend time with him anymore after the divorce. Even more so once they move into his old childhood home again because his aunt currently lives there. When snooping around the basement, he finds a weird energy orb that transports him back to the 1980s, and he gets to meet the kid version of his dad, who is, by no surprise, drastically different from the dad currently. But they get some pretty good mileage out of this as far as humor goes. I like when the dad takes away the kid's technology and says when he was a kid he was playing outside all day, but uh, nah. Dude was a hardcore gamer back in the day and always wanted to stay inside. It's, it's hilarious. But essentially what we get is a constant back and forth of this kid going to the past, playing with his dad, and then going to the future and using what he learned to better connect with his modern dad, and ultimately trying to get him out of his depressive rut. One thing that kind of struck a personal chord with me is how the main character mainly bonds with his dad over video games. Which, uh, I don't know. When I was a kid, uh, playing video games with my dad was like some of my best bonding moments. So to see that in this episode is just... Man. I love you, dad. But by, by the way, don't get all like, oh, that's so cute. My dad's never gonna fucking see this video. <laughs> And if he does, he's definitely not getting to this moment. Still love him though. But there is something looming in the background throughout this entire episode. As the aunt tells the main character that when they were kids, his dad had a best friend called Red, who fell down a well and disappeared. And that ever since that moment, the dad has changed and has had a hard time opening up to others. Of course, the kid version of dad ends up giving the main character a nickname of Red. So is the main character's fate sealed? Is he doomed to die? Uh, well, no, not really. Turns out the orb that transports the kid is running low on power, and near the end, its last resting spot is the well. So what the dad witnessed all those years ago wasn't a friend disappearing, but rather a son returning home. However, our main character decides to break the cycle, ultimately letting the orb disappear. But then it just like reappears like no problem, and he goes back to the present, and his dad's all happy, and he's still buried, and they all live happily ever after. And, like, yeah, it's kind of a cop-out ending. I'm not saying that these characters aren't deserving of a good ending, but I think building off of the foundation of what has been established would have been a much better way to go about it. Like, current day son and father had such a good thing going, and the dad truly was getting better, but all of a sudden the progress is just wiped away? It's strange. It's a great episode that kind of gets spoiled by the ending. Also, this is completely irrelevant, but the kid version of the dad has a stutter, meanwhile the older version doesn't? And like, this is never brought up or mentioned at any point. Maybe the child actor just had a stutter, I, 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 I don't know. But it's an inclusion I really liked, because yeah, there would be speech impediments that we would have as children that wouldn't carry over into our adult life right? I mean, if you met my seven-year-old self, I wouldn't be able to pronounce my L's or my R's. So, intentional or not, it's a little detail I really liked. The 
The Unfortunate Five is a detention-focused episode. Oh, wow. Kids in detention? That kind of reminds me of an episode from another series that I actually made a video on. And yeah, okay, I'm not going to self-promote the same video twice, considering I did so in the last video. That being said, I'll still link to a card in the top right if you want to watch it. <laughs> But this episode centers around five different kids stuck in detention. And immediately, we are treated to this explosive performance by this vice principal character that is so fantastic. His line deliveries and timing is impeccable. I kind of wish he was in the episode a little more, even though story-wise, it wouldn't make sense. He's just a great actor. But instead of a classic detention setting, all five of these kids have to sit around with a student counselor of sorts in a group therapy kind of setting. And it's there where they let all their emotions loose, and slowly the counselor seems to be enjoying this negative energy a little too much. After spying on her in the bathroom, it's revealed that the counselor is a demon of sorts that feeds off of negative emotions. So she's kind of purposely stirring the pot to get more raw emotions out of these students. Now admittedly, three out of these five characters are pretty irrelevant. I mean, you got this techie nerdy kid, you got this preppy cheerleader type, and then you got uh, this guy who is uh, just, just, just a guy. But really the standout people here is our main character and this quieter, shyer girl. Turns out these two used to be friends, but our main character joined the popular kid crowd and stopped talking to the other character. Shy girl, by the way, actually didn't get detention. She volunteered herself in order to talk to her ex-best friend. And they have a truly great scene together, really letting their emotions out in a healthy and positive way. And in the end, they figure out that the counselor is trying to select the most negative person to feed on, and so... They turn to the vice principal. They rile him all up, get him to release all of his negative emotions. And then the counselor is like, damn, smelling good. And then there's this great shot of her unhinging her jaw, which is absolutely horrific. And then she walks away like nothing happened. And all these kids get to go home knowing that they are culpable within a man's murder. It's, it's a great episode. Slapstick is an episode I thought was originally going to be like Creeped Out's version of Night of a Living Dummy. Maybe that's just my own bias getting in the way. I see some creepy dummy and automatically assume, oh, <laughs> they're doing some slappy shit here. So I was delighted to see that this episode takes a completely different angle with the story. You see, we follow our main character who desperately wants to be a part of the cool kids group, while also at the same time she is embarrassed of her parents. But like, their parents really aren't that embarrassing. They're actually super cool and loving and supportive. I mean, I get it. I was young once and I was also really embarrassed by my parents, but I guess it just shows how much older I'm getting as of recently when I can look at these eccentric parents and not think they're embarrassing, but think they're actually loving and cool. But she ends up catching a puppet show and cuts a deal with Mr. Blackteeth. That's the dummy's name. She wishes to have full control over her parents, and, well, she gets just that. Now the parents just lay there, absolutely vacant in expression, waiting for commands. It's actually really eerie and genuinely creeped me out. But even then, if she's not constantly giving them commands, they just kind of exist on autopilot. I specifically love how when they go to like this fancy dinner party thing, that the dad is just holding a bottle of wine the entire time, because like, he was never given specific commands on what to do with it, he was just told to bring wine, but <laughs> he just doesn't know where to put it. It's simultaneously a funny visual, but also a pretty creepy one too. Of course, the cool group of girls end up being complete bitches, and the main character ends up missing their parents and all their antics. And so she tracks down Mr. Blackteeth in an attempt to undo the effects, and he surprisingly agrees. However, she is trapped there, stuck serving underneath Mr. Blackteeth until she can find a replacement. She actually takes the spot of the boy who was stuck there previously. It's a great way to end the episode, and admittedly, I'm a bit of a sucker for endings that are just like, uh oh, the cycle never ends.
Bravery Badge has probably some of the best atmosphere in the entire series. But before I talk about any of that, let's set up this one proper. It's a zombie episode with Girl Scouts in the woods. But perhaps I'm underselling it just a little bit. You see, saying zombie is a bit of an oversimplification. In actuality, it's a parasite that ultimately infects all these Girl Scouts and they don't actually behave like zombies either. Instead, every infected person bleeds blue from their ear and they smile really creepily and they have this really eerie humming that they do. Yeah, uh, maybe pitching this as a zombie episode uh, wasn't a good idea on my part. These, these really aren't zombies. Oops. But our main characters are this one girl who is very much an overachiever and this other girl who just doesn't want to be there. But slowly, people by people in their troops slowly start getting infected. And there's this really great scene where they come across an old abandoned campsite from a Girl Scout troop that went missing in the 1980s. And this is some truly terrific set design here. What really adds to the creepy nature here is when they come across old diary entries that are really dark and morbid and kind of play out like Resident Evil diary entries. It's fantastic. In the end, it turns out that the parasite is defeated by loud music and, well, everyone is saved. Although, I gotta say that the visual of the parasite crawling out of the ears of these people is truly skin crawling. But I think this episode is fantastic when it comes to atmosphere, mystery, and suspense. Genuinely did not plan it out like this, but funnily enough, Itchy is kind of a similar concept to Bravery Badge. Just replace Girl Scouts with a military school and a parasite with lice and you got the same episode. But I think this episode is better for two main reasons. One being the threat. Lice are so microscopic, they're practically invisible. Factoring the notion that they could also exist on any surface, and all of a sudden the monster in this episode is omnipotent and practically invisible. Granted, they use these devices to see them, but still, they're relying on a piece of technology to see a threat. And two, this episode just grosses me out. I absolutely hate that when one character gets lice, they become incapacitated, unable to do anything else as they are stuck there feverishly scratching their heads. As if the lice are so bad and itchy, haha, they can't function. Mixed with the sound design of the scratching, I mean, yeah dude, you're gonna be scratching your head throughout this episode, and I fucking hate that feeling in a way that I love this episode for. The main character ends up putting special lice shampoo in the water system and pulling the fire alarm, effectively saving the day, but ultimately, the lice live on through a stray cat, which is a perfect, ambiguous ending. Tilly Bone, I think, is one of the most ambitious episodes in not just this series, but from any other children's horror anthology TV shows out there. Which I understand is a really specific category, but still. You see, this episode is formatted like the movie Memento, which is Christopher Nolan's best film, in my opinion. Fight me, you fucking Inception Interstellar fox. <laughs> Uh, somebody's definitely gonna leave a long ass comment about that. But that is to say that this episode is told completely in reverse. Now, that's quite the advantageous concept to tackle, but does it actually help the narrative or is it primarily just used as a gimmick? Well, I'd say it works. Near perfectly too, minus one hiccup at the end of the episode that I'm not a fan of that I'll get to. But doing a plot summary for this episode is going to be a complete nightmare. On one hand, I can just recap the story in chronological order, which is ironically the reverse order of how it's presented. However, if I do that, I kind of rob the episode of its magic. But if I recap the episode in the order it was presented, it would be a jumbled mess and it would take a lot longer to fully explain everything. So instead, I'm going to provide the main beats within this story. Okay, so there's this group of friends who are all coming over to binge watch this series called Outer Realms, which for all intents and purposes, it's Star Wars, right? It's clearly Star Wars. 
Our main character is actually a vlogger, which is why she films everything in this handheld found footage style. And she makes vlogs talking about how bad the prequels are and how the creator doesn't know what he's doing with his own franchise. Right? So clearly Star Wars. So cool, friends hanging out and watching a movie. However, there's another character there called Junebug, and Junebug brings with her what is called a Tilly Bone. Now, the Tilly Bone can kind of be tricky to explain. Basically, you blow this red mist at whoever you desire, and that will create a Tilly. And a Tilly is basically like a manifestation of sorts. Meaning, whatever the person was thinking of at the moment they were blasted with the red mist will come through to fruition. Like, this dude gets hit with the mist at the same time he was thinking about eating some cake. So then his body constantly and painfully compels him to eat that cake. Or this girl who thinks of a doll she had when she was a kid and that very doll keeps popping up no matter how hard she tries to get rid of it. So once again, this is all told in reverse order. So it's actually quite funny how we get to see this night start in utter chaos and then progressively get more calm. Eventually, near the end of the episode, uh, uh, or, uh, start of the, of the story, <laughs> You know what I mean. We see Junebug befriending the main character and explain how she could get back at her friends with the Tilly Bone. Because we then rewind even further back to find out our main character's friends played a prank on her and got her to dress up as one of the characters from Outer Realms to basically embarrass herself in front of the entire school. So at the end, we learn everything that transpired that night was because of our main character wanting to get back at her friends. And it's a perfect revelation to end on. Basically, throughout the entire episode, we, the audience, fucking hate Junebug and wonder why she's tormenting this friend group. And for us to learn it was all because of the main character? Simply perfect. A great subversion. And then the show kind of fucks it all up. We see that before the friends prank the main character, Junebug actually snuck up on our main character and used the Tilly Bone on her. And like... <laughs> Uh, okay, I've seen people online say that our main character in this moment was thinking about her friends pranking her, and since she got hit with the Tilly Bone, those manifestations became true. And I hate that interpretation, because on one hand, that takes the responsibility out of the main character and once again places all the blame and villainization back on Junebug, and undermines the subversion. But on the other hand, yeah. That's totally what happens here. But then we go back one more time and we find out that the actual creator of Outer Realms sent our main character a little wooden doll. But not just any doll. If you blink, you'll miss it. But that doll is of Junebug. So, what does this mean? I don't fucking know. And then the episode just ends, like this is supposed to be some big revelation. Meanwhile, my ass is over here on Google typing in Tilly Bone Ending Explained because what the fuck was that? So, some people online have said that, yeah, this doll is in fact of Junebug, but rather, this doll is Junebug, and that the doll comes alive to torment the main character because of all of her hateful vlogs about Outer Realms, which is so stupid. You see, I liked all the Outer Realms things throughout the episode. It was more or less a nice through line. You got the initial vlog setting up the found footage aspect, you got the Outer Realms cosplay as the inciting incident, and you got the Outer Realms binge watch as a setting. It's a good grounding for the sake of the story and its format that's presented in, right? But I had no clue this episode was going to end with the whole be careful with the people you mock online shtick or fucking whatever it's trying to say. And I'm not kidding, if this episode ended with the prank and we didn't get the whole Junebug hitting the main character with a Tilly Bone, and especially if we didn't get the whole Junebug doll stuff, this episode? Number one. No doubt in my mind. I love the format of the storytelling, the characters were great, the scares were pretty good. It was overall just a creative tour de force, absolutely ruined by the last three minutes or whatever. I mean, that being said, it's still top five, but Come on, it could have been number one. Shed No Fear is just a really fun episode that reminds me of those classic children adventure movies from the 80s, like Goonies. Which is really ironic considering that this episode takes place in the 70s? Or at the very least, the very early 80s. This episode has a rather simple premise of a kid trying to clear out his grandma's shed. However, there's a mysterious dark force lurking within the shed that transports these kids a couple blocks down in an abandoned pool. I mean, I don't know if the monster has like a limited range in which he can teleport these kids, but like, just teleport them really high over some pavement 
and be done with this whole thing. But what we get essentially plays out like a roguelike video game, with their characters dying, learning new strategies, applying new strategies, and, well, dying again. But at the heart of this episode is the relationship between these two characters. It's really good. You see, they're both nerds who used to be best friends, but eventually one joins the football team and ignores the other one. I mean, they squash their beef pretty fast, all things considered, once the main character decides to help out with the monster problem, but the other kid does leave the football team entirely and stands up for his friend, so I guess it pays off on both sides. But what we get is just great chemistry and a fun adventure. Oh yeah, and they make some device with a disco ball killing this thing. It's really not that serious, it's more focused on fun, if anything, which it truly exceeds at. I mean, to show how fun it is, even the end tag with the curious shows him busting a move, like, damn, homeboy's got the sauce. But this episode knows what it is, and I absolutely love it for that. I can tell that one more minute probably hits a little too close to home for some of you out there. And don't worry, it hits a little close to home for me as well. You see, this episode centers around this kid who is seemingly just an average kid. He's got a younger brother, a friend group, and even a crush. However, he loves playing this video game, and one night he decides to play for just one more minute, and before he even knows it, it's morning time. I mean, we've all been there at some point. Shit, that was literally me last year when Tears of the Kingdom came out. However, the next day, he decides to play the game again, and just like before, once his friends hop offline, he decides to play for just one more minute. And just like before, it's morning again. Except, an entire month has passed. Our main character has no idea what happened. But everyone else makes comments on how he hasn't been himself for the past month, and how he's just been isolating himself and playing this game every chance he got. We also find out that his best friend got with his crush, and his grades are slipping, and his parents are growing worried and disappointed in him. However, our main character decides to turn his life around. He starts hitting the books, actually hangs out with his friends again, and he's there for his brother. But then, he decides to play the game again, and before we know it, a whole Five years have passed. Our main character looks completely different. Well, only in reflections. They still show him as a child. A choice I was a little disappointed with, but ultimately grew to love because it makes sense. Despite looking so different, he's still just a child who didn't grow up. In this five year time skip, we learn that nobody has really interacted with our main character in those five years. Not his old friends or even his brother. He's a complete loser who's dedicated every second of his life to this one fantasy video game. RuneScape fans know what I'm talking about. Hey and in the end, he decides to sit back down and play his video games. So yeah, there is no happy ending. This kid grows up to be a burnout loser who missed out years of his life playing video games. Meanwhile, he's failing out of school and has no prospects. Why'd you cut to me? What are you trying to insinuate? Nah, nah, fuck this. But in all seriousness though, I think a lot of people can relate to something like this in some way. I mean, video games within this story can be taken literally, but video games can also be substituted for really anything else. I think as humans, and especially as 20-somethings, I think one of the greatest fears with growing up is the idea that we're wasting our life and not truly taking everything in. And I think this episode captures that feeling so hauntingly well, it's honestly really disturbing. Trolled is an episode that I truly thought I was going to hate, but little did I know, it's one of the best episodes. I mean, come on though, an episode with a title like Trolled, with a storyline centered around a kid trolling people online? I'm sorry, I was already 13 once, and I'm not really trying to relive that era. But I was never so happy to be wrong about this episode. Instead, what we get is some of the best body horror in children's media, point blank period. You see, this episode centers around this kid who just trolls on the internet. More specifically, like a boarding school social media service. You know, like how Facebook originated for people attending Harvard. Uh, 
kind of like that. But his form of trolling is just sharing secrets and spreading gossip about his fellow classmates via an anonymous account. And really, this is more of a device for our main character to get together with this one girl in his school. He like kind of trolls her online and then he's like the shoulder to cry on. It's, it's, it's actually kind of fucked up. But one day after some epic trolling in the classic internet troll posture, our main character gets cryptic messages telling him to stop his devious ways or suffer the consequences. And he ignores these messages and we get introduced to our central conflict in the episode. You see, our main character attends some elite boarding school, which is quite expensive and his mom can no longer pay for it. However, there is a scholarship awarded for the best tenor soloist. Cause it's like a, a, a Catholic school and these kids perform like a church choir thing. By the way, our main character over here has some angelic pipes. So that's the stakes for this episode. Our main character has to perform a solo in order to get a scholarship. But before that, it's right back to trolling. With a messenger coming back and being like, dude, really? I warned you. Anyways, fuck you. And then slowly our main character starts experiencing changes. The first change is to his foot, which Jesus Christ, that is so fucking nasty and some really great makeup effects, but ugh. But our main character just brushes it off like it's nothing and goes back to trolling. He can't stop trolling. And because of that, his stomach changes. And yeah, that's also grotesque and really great makeup. I'm really grossed out by the vein specifically. But if it isn't really obvious, our main character is slowly turning into a troll. All with fantastically gross and disturbing makeup and prosthetics that just look fucking vile in the best way possible. I specifically really like how his feet become so big and bloated that they just burst out of his shoes. It's gnarly, but it's a fantastic little detail. But with his recital in mere hours, our main character pleads with the messenger to change him back to normal. And the messenger gives him an ultimatum. Let nobody see you until the next day when dawn breaks and you'll go back to normal. Not a big deal. Only problem? That would mean that he would have to miss out on the recital, therefore losing his chance at the scholarship and therefore getting kicked out of school. The other option offered is for him to come forward and announce to the whole school that he is the anonymous person online trolling everyone. So our main character says, fuck all that. I'm just going to go to the recital and have a sheet over my face. And by all means everything works out fine at first until uh until it just doesn't the whole school sees him in all his ugly glory and we the audience also see him for the first time one thing i really like about this episode is we just get to see little glimpses of the transformation we see the gross feet the bloated fingers the silhouette of his figure but we never truly see the full transformation until the very end it's really great filmmaking basic filmmaking sure but it's great nonetheless but our character just runs off stage Technically, in this scenario, the only way to go back to normal once being seen is admitting that you're the online troll. But our main character can't bring himself to do it, hence him running off. And then he goes outside and turns into stone? And then the whole school just presumes he's missing and installs his stone body as a gargoyle? It's such a bizarre and dark ending, I, I absolutely love it. The Many Place is a lot of things. It's surreal, it's scary, it has a dreadful existential nature to it. Its atmosphere is moody and soul crushing. The level of suspense is unrivaled. The creativity is off the charts and above all else, it's the fucking backrooms. It's the backrooms episode. It's the episode everybody points to and goes, hey, that's the fucking backrooms. And they're not wrong, I mean. But I personally like to think it's much more than that. You see, by pressing all the buttons on the hotel elevator, these kids end up in a reality that exists outside of their own, or rather, exists outside of any reality, like purgatory or a loading zone. A never-ending labyrinth of familiar layouts and picture frames, hallways that extend for infinity, yellow wallpaper, and... Uh, yeah, okay, it's, it's the fucking back rooms. God damn it! Although, I will say, what's really interesting about this episode, or... Rather, what's really eerie about this episode is that this episode came out on May 15th, 2019. And the original Backroom 4chan post came out on May 14th, 2019. So clearly, this episode is an original idea. Uh, 
Nobody's making an episode for television in one day. If you're trying to insinuate that, oh, tell the 4chan post came out first. It's like, no, fucking don't be stupid now. They did not make all of this after seeing some 4chan post that <laughs> didn't even blow up until a little bit later. But this also means that the original 4chan post wasn't inspired by Creeped Out and thus was also an original idea. I just think it's really interesting that two similar ideas kind of came forth in this world at the same time almost. Uh, it's kind of a crazy coincidence. Anyways, I do think this episode really does drive home the existential nature of a never-ending labyrinth. I mean, you feel just like these kids, completely and utterly helpless. It's fantastic. And at one point, this brother and sister accidentally get split apart from their little sister. So not only are they lost trying to find their way out, but now they also have to find their little sister. It's great, but this also gives them time to eventually find an elevator back, except when they return, it's to a different reality. You see, the back rooms, or as this episode calls it, the many place, is a reality that exists outside of all other realities. What this essentially means is that there's an infinite amount of elevators that can take people to an infinite number of different realities. So now these kids have to not only navigate this insane labyrinth, but also pray they find the right elevator back home. Oh, yeah, and there's a monster in the many place that is out and about. So, that's fucking terrifying. And then after trial and error and trial and error and still not finding their little sister, everything seems hopeless, but we get a quick little pep talk from little bro here, and these two are back in action with an actual strategy at play. Marking doors they look through, using a megaphone to call out for their little sister, and drawing arrows on the wall, not only to keep themselves oriented in the correct direction, but leaving a path for the little sister if she happens to come across them as well. It's great, and it's actually really cool to see some actual strategy be applied to a situation like this, instead of just having them aimlessly wander around. But they do eventually find their little sister. Turns out, she actually befriended the monster. And the monster actually won't attack them, and even guide them back to their reality as long as they don't look at them. So what we get is this really great scene of these characters closing their eyes, not being able to see the monster, but also we the audience not being able to see the monster too. We really only get little glimpses at its hands and other features that are indiscernible. I don't know why, but this part of the episode is really suspenseful for me, and I really was on the edge of my seat. But once they do enter the elevator, Lil Sis opens her eyes, and we get to see just a rather quick glimpse, and yep, that's terrifying. But despite being back in their original reality, there's one problem. There's now two little sisters. Yep, that's right. Another little sister from another reality crossed over into this one. And then the episode ends. And I sit there and I realize I just watched perfection. There's so much I absolutely love about this episode, even down to the small little details. Like, I really love the elevator music. It's eerily tranquil, and somehow both calming and anxiety-inducing at the same time. But I can go on forever about how great this episode is. It's truly magnificent. And if you were going to watch any episode from this show, I think it has to be The Many Place. Now with Goosebumps, Are You Afraid of the Dark, Haunting Hour, and Creeped Out, I'll ask the same question again. What should I rank next? Keep in mind, a lot of you guys are suggesting horror anthology shows like Eerie Indiana or Dead Time Stories or Nightmare Room, and that's totally fine. And I totally plan on ranking each of those series at some point, if not very soon. But expand your horizons a little bit. Don't be limited by these parameters. Give me some creative suggestions, you know? I'm really down for whatever now that these ranking videos are going to become a consistent series on the channel. Colin, you should rank every Bratz movie from worst to best. Colin, you should rank every Disney Channel horror movie from worst to best. Colin, you should rank every fucking Mary Kate and Ashley movie from worst to best. Sure, I'm down. I'll do that. If you want it, I'll do it. Because that seems fun. And I'm, this is fun. I'm having fun. So really, the sky's the limit. Just leave a comment down below, and if a lot of people suggest it, or a lot of people like a certain comment, I'll do it. Simple as that. Anyways, as always, thanks for watching.